study. And we welcome you to the virtual Bible study for Thursday, June uh, June 13th, 2019. June 13th, yeah. Welcome to the Virtual Bible Study tonight. My name is Jacob Gwynn. My father, Greg Gwynn, is here. Hello, Dad. Jacob, great to be with you We're tonight. We're a little bit uh, touchy on the dates tonight because we missed a program last week. Uh, almost uh, a, a real rarity on the Virtual Bible Study, a week without a, a program. And uh, it was not by choice. What happened was we came in here getting ready to do the program last week and no Internet connection. And our Internet service provider couldn't say why, and they couldn't get us back online, and so we had to bail out. Yeah, and Kyle's behind the controls tonight. Kyle was here. Kyle, you can usually work some pretty impressive f feats here, but you couldn't even get us going. No, it's uh, the internet. Completely, internet was out to the building, so it's yeah. That's Kyle was over. Our... Uh, Kyle was listening in when I was talking to him on the phone, talking to our internet people on the phone, and they said, "So this was Thursday night." And they said, "We will have a technician out there by Sunday afternoon." I said, that's completely unacceptable. Uh, but they couldn't get there in time to, to get us back online. Yeah. But we're back tonight, and we're glad that you're with us, and we look forward to hearing from you at 877-381-4567. Email us questions at collegeview.com. And uh, they're filing into the chat room tonight. Uh, sign in there and chat with other listeners. I see Lou in Minnesota, uh, Dwight in Iowa, Daniel in Florida. Uh, not sure where Rick, Rick is. Rick, I, I sh we should know where Rick is. Rick, he's told us before. Tell us again where you're at, Rick. All right. And see Mount Pleasant, Tennessee in there. So... Uh, folks from far and wide tonight, and we'll look forward to hearing your comments on this important uh, discussion tonight. But before we get started, I, I think we need to start probably uh, advertising an event coming up uh, here in Columbia, Tennessee. Yeah, just uh, about five weeks away, I guess, now. Uh, I haven't looked at the calendar to see how many weeks, but it's coming up fast. July 22nd and 23rd is our annual community Bible study. This will be the ninth year that we've done this. We picked two nights, a Monday and a Tuesday night in July. This year it's the 22nd and 23rd. We go to a municipal auditorium near downtown Columbia called the Municipal Building. Uh, excuse me, called the Memorial Building. It's a municipal auditorium called the M Memorial Building. And uh, we, we try to engage uh, uh, in study of something that we think is particularly important to to the citizens of our community and try to reach out and sh and and share some bible truths with them this year's theme is going to be god country no excuse me god family country god family country is our theme wilson adams who is a gospel preacher from murfreesboro tennessee is going to be our speaker and he has sent me some information about how he's going to approach those subjects monday night's going to be about the family Tuesday night is going to be about our country, and I think he's really uh, going to have some really interesting and important things to share with us. It should be very interesting. If you're anywhere within a driving distance of Middle Tennessee, um, come to Columbia. Plan to make your trip here on July 22nd and or 23rd, Monday and Tuesday nights for our ninth annual community Bible study, God, right. Family, Country. Okay, it should be a good study, and you'll want to be a part of it if you're anywhere in the area be making plans for that. We have good attendance, uh, lots of visitors, and you'll want to be one of them. So make plans to be here uh, coming up in about five weeks. We'll keep you posted on that date, and there'll be some information posted to our website. Rick is in Bald Knob, Arkansas, he says. All right. Thanks, Thanks Rick. Thanks, Rick, for, for calling in or dialing this up tonight. All right, uh, baptism. Uh, it uh, is a, a very controversial subject. Uh, we believe the scriptures are somewhat straightforward, or, well, absolutely straightforward on the subject. Uh, and so we want to look at uh, some of the confusion tonight and see if we can't make sense of what the Bible teaches on baptism. So last week, last Thursday, I sent out to our update list some questions. I resent them today since we didn't get to use them last week, and we have responses from last week. So if you responded last week, don't fear. We still have your responses, and we'll try to include them. But we asked the questions, and again, if you're not on our update list, get on the list by sending us an email to questions at collegeview.com and just say, add me to the list. Number one, how would you respond to someone who says, baptism doesn't make any sense to me, and therefore I'm not going to be baptized? Okay. Number two, what answer would you give to those who accuse us of believing that there's a special power in the water of baptism? Okay. Number three, uh, in making sense of baptism, what is its real purpose? What's really the purpose or purposes of baptism? Number four, what's the proper mode of baptism? Sprinkling, pouring, immersion? 
And then finally, number five, who should be baptized? And specifically, what about infant baptism? All right. Uh, this should be a good discussion. Lots to cover, so we need to just jump in. What about that first one, Jacob? I, I tell you, I just, don't get, I just don't get how baptism has... How could me getting my physical body wet have anything to do with saving my inner man, my eternal soul? That just doesn't make sense to me. And so since I can't make sense of it, I'm not going to be baptized. Yeah. We hear that kind of reaction pretty often. We, yeah, we do. And also some folks, I think, may not say it in as many terms, but they have trouble reconciling their beliefs with the idea that, bapti that the, the Scripture say baptism is required. So some may say, well, it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense to me. Others would say, well, I know that I'm saved by faith, so why would I have to be baptized? That doesn't make any sense to me. I, it, it, baptism, obviously, is not something I need to do because the Bible says I'm saved by faith. And so, it, so if they can't make sense of it, they're not going to do it is, is, is sometimes the response. I, I went back to think about some Old Testament examples of things that God told people to do that didn't really make sense from a human perspective. It didn't take long to make a long list there, did it? Oh, yeah. For instance, I got a couple, I think, uh, maybe two or three that stick out. Moses was told to strike the rock to bring forth water. Mm -hmm. You know, Moses could have said, I, I, wait a minute. I know a little bit about digging wells, because people did dig wells back then. Oh, they did, yeah. And uh, I, that's not how you, you stay get away water. from rocks. That's not yeah. how, yeah, you don't want any rocks around when you're yeah. digging for water. Yeah. That I know something about getting water, and that is not how you get water. Yeah. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Well, obviously, they wouldn't have gotten water. Or how about the Israelites at Jericho? Yeah. So uh, God says, at Jericho, I want you to march around the city six times, uh, six days, once each day for six days. And on the seventh day, I want you to march around the city seven times, blow your trumpets, shout, the walls will fall down. I, you can almost imagine some of the Israelites saying, we're supposed to do what? I mean, we know, we, we know some about warfare. We've, we've already been in some pretty significant battles leading right. up to this. And I never, categorically never heard of trying to attack a fortified city by just marching around and shouting and blowing horns. Crazy. That doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> so, and so yeah. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Well, they wouldn't have won Jericho. Yeah. Or what about, here's a, here's a classic, what about Naaman? Naaman the leper uh, in 2 Kings chapter 5. And Elisha sent his messenger out. Elisha, did, I know this had to be an affront to the great general Naaman. And, and so he sent, Elisha sent his, his, his servant out there and said, go dip seven times in the river Jordan and you'll be cleansed of the leprosy. Of course, leprosy was an incurable disease then and now. And Naaman said, what? Dip seven times in the Jordan River? We got better rivers than the Jordan yep. back home. Right. And I, that does not make any sense. And he, was, he was actually enraged yep. and stormed off. And only when his servants got him calmed down and said, you know, if the prophet had asked you to do some great thing, you would have done it. How much easier to just do what he said. But again, if he hadn't have done, even though I want to tell you, even to us, dipping in a muddy river seven times to cure leprosy, that doesn't make sense. I'm not going to do it. Rick in the chat room is on the same brainwave. He, uh, he had this sent in right when you started about Naaman, I guess, or before. He said, what if Naaman dipping in the Jordan obviously made no sense to him? It was only after he did what seemed foolish to him that he was cleansed. A good example of how the foolishness of God is wiser than man. Exactly right. Exactly right. So what you're just saying is from the Old Testament is we can see a pattern that God, when God gives instructions, they don't necessarily have to make sense. It doesn't have sense. to make sense. And so, you know, I think it's a bit of human arrogance for us to say, if, if it doesn't make sense to me, if my pea brain can't grasp a reason for it, then I don't think we should have to do it. That's, that's, that's really a, a, a statement of arrogance. God expects obedience, whether it makes <clears throat> sense to us or not. Yeah. Uh, and so... When we talk about the simple gospel plan of salvation, you have to hear the truth. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. 
You have to believe what you've heard. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Uh, um, you've got to repent. Except you repent, Luke 13, 3. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You have to verbally confess your faith in Jesus. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, You're talking uh, about verse verses 10. there to tell you things you need to do in order to be saved. Yeah. If you don't do these, it says you won't be saved. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, one must be baptized. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, verse 16. Okay. Now, so you have to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized in order to be saved. Any one of those. Actually, God could have done it any way he wanted to. God could have put any stipulations on salvation that he chose to. He, he chose those. And I actually think, and we'll talk more about it, I think we can make some sense of it. I think we can see some reasons for those things. But even if we don't, how, why would this be, why would it be more... <clears throat> difficult for us to obey those simple instructions than it was for the children of Israel to march around Jericho yeah. or for Moses to strike the rock. God just expects obedience, and no matter if that makes sense to us or not, he wants us to do that. Let's go to the inbox and get Kent. He says, uh, he's from Calhoun, Georgia. He says, just because one states that baptism does not make sense, that does not mean to, that such does not make sense. The New Testament gives us clear instruction regarding the subject, and that is all that really matters. One does not have to know why God chose water baptism as a condition of forgiveness. He did, and that settles the entire issue. You know, there used to be a saying that went around... Uh, uh, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And we commented, and that was years ago when that was sort of a popular expression, we commented that it's actually not, that's not accurate. God said it, that settles it, yeah. whether I believe it or not. That's right. That's right. Mohan is up in the Chicago land area, and he said, there may be many things in the Bible where God commands us to do things that, do, that may not make sense, but we simply have to obey, trusting that God is wiser than we are with our finite minds, it may take humility to do this, Mohan says. Oh, yeah. I hadn't heard from Mohan in a good while. Good to hear from you, Mohan. And then Daniel down in uh, Jennings, Florida, says Matthew 28, 18 through 20, this is a command of Jesus and needs to be followed like all of Jesus' commands. Mark 16, 16, it is necessary like belief is necessary for salvation. Thank yes. you, Daniel. And then Jared's down in Valdosta, or Lake Park, Georgia tonight. And he says, um, he references Proverbs 3, 5, and 7. Uh, Proverbs 14, verse 12, and Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. I'll get the first one. You get the second one. I haven't looked these up yet. From Okay. Uh, I, and, and, and then he references Jeremiah 10, 23, uh, uh, and James 4, verse 6. So, Matt, uh, go ahead. Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. All right. Very appropriate. Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seemeth right to the man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, or your ways my ways, say the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So God, God says, hey, don't try you're to not, You're not out. thinking at my level. Yeah, yeah we, we're not even uh, on the same plane. Don't, yeah. Yeah, don't waste your time. Jeremiah 10, 23 is a famous one. Oh, Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. All right, and then James chapter 4, verse 6 is on Daniel or Jared's list tonight. Uh, but he giveth more grace. Therefore, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth, <laughs> giveth grace to the humble. And Incor incorporated in that idea of humility is that we're going to submit to what he says to do. We're not going to we're not going to talk back. We're not going to give uh, suggestions on how we think it could be better. We're going to be humble enough to say, if God said it, I'm going to do it. Uh, that's the way that God expects us to be. You know, and and w we could have so much greater unity in the religious world if everybody just had that view. It, it, God said to do that, and I'm going to do that. It's not hard. I mean, the the instructions about baptism are not difficult. No, they're not. And, and so the Bible clearly describes baptism as a necessity, a condition of salvation. I'm not going to argue that. I'm just going to do it. Kyle, we got to just uh, get our thoughts and our opinions out of the way so we can submit to God's. That's always that's what's in everything. Whenever, in what's Colossians 3.17, uh, in word or deed, we do all in the name of you know Jesus Christ. We're just giving service to God, which we... We show allegiance to Jesus, and that's serving God. And all that we do, we must acknowledge God and just do what he says, not what uh, what we want. All right, we're going to get a break, and when we get back, we're going to get your thoughts. Dwight's out in Iowa said Noah submitted to God for 120 years in building the ark.
Well, exactly. there's one that probably didn't make any sense. No. And, and you know what? And I think that's a great observation, Dwight. There's an argument made, and, and I'm kind of sympathetic to the argument, that it had not even rained on earth before the flood. And so Noah was told to make this massive vessel because a flood was coming. And I got to tell you, that just probably didn't make any sense to Noah at all. No. And it was a huge assignment, and yet he did it by faith. That's right. All right. We're going to get a break and uh, take this time to send in your comments. When we get back, next question. The next question is going to be, what, what answer would you give to those who accuse us of believing that there's some kind of special power in the water of baptism? Okay. We're going to get a break. Uh, don't go anywhere. We're back right after this. There's more of the virtual Bible study to come after these important messages. Stay tuned. Tonight on Channel 8 WSIN, it's TV like you've never seen it before. Starting at 8, it's TV's funniest new comedy, Fornication in the City, and Marie has been misbehaving again. Guess what? I just cheated on my husband. He doesn't even know about it. <laughs> and then at 8.30, it's the show that's setting the standard. You won't want to miss this week's I Love This World, where Bob makes a great announcement. Well, I think it's time you knew the truth. I'm gay. <laughs> and at 9 o'clock, it's the show that Television Magazine has called the number one drama for murder and violence. You won't want to miss this week's In Cold Blood to see who will be the next to be gunned down. It all starts tonight at 8 o'clock on Channel 8 WSIN. I'm Greg Gwynn reminding you that sin is a terrible thing and that those who are entertained by watching others sin fall under the condemnation of God that is mentioned in Romans 1.28. Be careful what you watch on television because in spite of what the devil wants you to think, sin is always sin and it's never funny. Here's some quotes worth pondering. What you do for yourself will be soon forgotten, but what you do for others will be long remembered. He whose goal is to please his audience usually fails God, and he who pleases God cannot please all of his audience. You don't get much done by starting tomorrow. Love without action is just lazy. In fact, it's not real love at all. Man, wish I'd said that. Now that you've had your break, it's back to the program. And we're back on the program tonight as we look at baptism, trying to make sense of it, uh, look at what the Scriptures teach, compare it with some of the objections that some folks have to the idea of baptism. <laughs> Excuse yeah. me, go ahead. And, and one, of the, one of the things that people say is, well, you all think that there's, there's some kind of special power in the water. That, that, you know, my, mystical powers in the waters of baptism. That Actually, that argument may have been encouraged by what we think is an erroneous concept of the Catholic Church when they, they actually have what they call holy water, yeah. special water that has been blessed or somehow or another received a... a some kind of empowerment by their processes that are nowhere described in the Bible. We actually think not at all. We don't think there's any power in the water whatsoever. And, and I think this is pretty well spelled out in 1 Peter 3, verse 21. In 1 Peter 3, verse 21, Peter says, the like, he just talked about Noah's faith in constructing the ark. Yeah. And he says, the like figure, in other words, Noah's salvation by faith, Obedient faith in the ark was a, was a shadowy symbol of the reality of our salvation in Christ, including baptism. So he just mentioned Noah. He says that Noah was a figure of baptism. He says, the like figure wherein to baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of the dead. Notice, first of all, pretty hard phrase to, to skip over. Baptism doth also now save us. We've asked people on the virtual Bible study before, Jacob, uh, who don't believe in the necessity of baptism. How do you explain that? And, and uh, to, in my way of thinking, never received any sort of satisfactory response. That's pretty straightforward. Baptism doth also now save us. But he, Peter goes on. He says, it's not the putting away of the filth of flesh. He says, it's not just getting your body wet. It's not taking a bath, but rather the answer of a good conscience toward God. So when I engage in that act from the heart, 
that has to be done from the heart. Uh, uh, my conscience is responding to God yes. in that act of baptism. That's 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 there's there's where it's powerful. Not because there's special power in the water. It's not just the water getting my body wet. But when I engage in that act with a pure conscience toward God, then He says also what he, what really makes it work is it's by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Only because Jesus Christ is our resurrected Savior does baptism have the power to save. But since he was resurrected from the dead, and it, when we respond in a, in a good conscience, engaging in that physical act of baptism, it saves us. All right. Uh, in the chat room tonight, uh, Rick uh, says, I would again go to the example of Naaman. Who would say the power that cured his leprosy was in the muddy waters of the Jordan? Obedience is what saves, and he references Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9. Uh, Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9 says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. Notice this, unto all them that obey him. He also references 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. Uh, and, uh, and to you who are troubled with us, when the Lord shall be revealed from uh, the heavens and his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. All right. All right. Uh, uh, Dwight in the chat room says there's power in the blood of Christ and one must be baptized to come in contact with the blood of Christ. And I think that's right. Uh, I, I agree with Dwight about that, that baptism is where we actually make contact with the blood of Jesus. Romans 6 verse 3 says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Well, what happened in his death? His blood was shed. So we are baptized into Christ. We're baptized into his death. We make contact with the blood of Christ in baptism. And so, uh, again, to anyone who says that we believe that there's some kind of special power in the water, uh, no, that's a misrepresentation, misrepresentation of our position. We never said that. We don't believe that. Kent says, noted faith only preachers have repeatedly made this charge. I had one Baptist preacher in East Tennessee falsely accuse me of preaching that one could see sins floating in the baptistry and when the water was drained, watch such sins go down the drain. Such statements are not only false, they are ridiculous. No one teaches that there is special power in water that saves anyone. We correctly affirm that the act of obedience in baptism that saves sinners, uh, just like a condition of faith, he references uh, 1 Peter 3.21. Yeah. Mohan says there's no power in the water. Water baptism is simply an act of obedience. Even though the blood of Christ is what saves us, the blood saves us when we have truly obeyed the gospel of Christ by believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized for the forgiveness of sins. That's interesting that Mohan didn't always have this opinion. He didn't believe that always, but he's studied, and, and to his credit, he's come to, the, to that conclusion based upon his diligent study of the Word. Yeah, I appreciate his comments tonight. Daniel's down in Florida, says uh, 1 Peter 3.21, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience. When Naaman was healed, once he obeyed the command to dip seven times, his... Uh, conclusion was that, that not that the water had the power, but that God that gave the command had power. He references 2 Kings 5, verses 14 and 15. You know, that's a good point, Daniel. I, I, in other words, so... He, did, he didn't come out of the water, so, oh, boy, there's something special about this water. Yeah, it, his first criticism was the, the, the Jordan River. We got better rivers than that back home. Why should I have to baptize, be he dipped? He was thinking that the water would be what saved yeah, him then. Why, why would I have to dip in that muddy uh, Jordan River? But after he did and he was healed... It says he went down, this is 2 Kings 5, 14, mm -hmm. he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean, and he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Uh, so, in other words, yeah. he said... He came back to Elisha and he says, You know, there really is superpower in that Jordan River well, water. We need to bottle that up and sell it. Yeah. No. Oh. What he said was, I know there's a God in Israel. Yeah. And then Jared in Georgia says, uh, 1 Peter 3.21, it's not about the water. It is about uh, humbling ourselves to obedience and asking God to cleanse us. Any references for uh, Romans 6, verses 3 through 5, we are uniting ourselves to Christ by symbolically dying, being buried, and rising to walk in newness of life. Exactly right. All right. All right. So we've dealt with the first two questions. Uh, someone says, does that make sense to me? Well... Not to be not to be rude or uh, disrespectful, 
It doesn't matter if it doesn't make sense to you. Well, now. <laughs> we're going to talk. We're gonna, <clears throat> I think we can see that there is. That, that's our next question, by the way. What, what, in, in making sense of baptism, what purposes does it serve? And I think we can see that it does serve a purpose. But if I never make sense of it, it doesn't matter. It's still plainly taught, and I must do it. We've talked about the purpose a little bit. We've touched on it already. But yeah. uh, go ahead and give us some more. And then we just now talked about it's not the water. It's, the, it's faith and obedience. So the third question we said, in making sense of baptism, what is its real purpose or purposes? Well, uh, it is, and we just, we, we just read part of this, but it is very much uh, a, a, a likeness to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Let me read Romans 6, beginning verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Uh, and so Paul there very much said, you know, and, and you know, you think about the act of baptism, very symbolic, very very similar in form of laying a dead person in a grave, a, a person, a, 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 a sinner, a, a dead in sin is laid in the, the watery grave, sometimes we refer to it as the watery grave of baptism, and they come forth, as Paul said there, to walk in newness of life. It's like they've been resurrected. So you bury a person dead in sin, and when they come out of the water of baptism, it's like they've been resurrected to a new life. And so it's very symbolically similar to Jesus dying, being buried, and being resurrected. And so if, if you think of it in that fashion, it, it is perfect symbolism. It makes complete sense. Mm, it does. Okay. Let's see what our, our <clears throat> listener said. says, the New Testament makes the design of baptism very clear, such, uh, such is A, essential to the new birth, John 3, 3 through 5. Necessary for salvation, Mark 16, verse 16, and 1 Peter 3, verse 21. For the remission of sins, Acts 2.38, such stands between the sinner and having his sins washed away, Acts 22, verse 16. Such brings the sinner into the death of Christ where his blood was shed, Romans 6, verses 3 through 7. Such puts one into fellowship with Christ, Galatians 3, verse 27. And such puts one into the fellowship with the church of Christ that, that is comprised of all those who have been saved, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, Acts 2, verse 47. And finally, such is the time and place where one exercises an obedient faith in the operation of God to forgive sin, Colossians 2, verses 12 and 13. Very good, Kent. Yeah, very we thorough. We spend a lot of time on each one of those verses. Yeah. They're all very important, and they all do make the points that he, he mentions there. Um, <clears throat> appreciate that important response. All and right. then Mohan says uh, its purpose is for the forgiveness of our sins, Acts 2, 38. And Mark 16, 16. Look at those verses very carefully. Mark 2, 30, Acts 2, 38, Mark 16, verse 16. Uh, they tell us that baptism is what uh, allows us to have the forgiveness of our sins, and it's what saves us in, in Mark 16, verse 16. Uh, Daniel, answer of a good conscience, First Peter 3, 21. Just as God had a plan to save Noah, he had en has enacted a plan to save us and gets us in the only safe place left to be, and that's Christ, in Galatians 3, 26 through 29. So we're baptized into Christ, Daniel says. That's where the salvation and safety is. All right. uh, and then uh, Jared says it is to wash away our sins, Acts 22, verse 16. Paul was told by Ananias to arise and wash away his, uh, be baptized, wash away his sins, and to put us into Christ, Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. Really good. All those are really good answers. So the, the purposes of baptism are lined out in the Scriptures very clearly. Uh, the symbolism of, of a death, burial, and resurrection is very graphic. And then all of those verses, especially that Kent enumerated, uh, as to what's accomplished when we do submit in humble obedience to the instruction of God to be baptized. Someone says, well, why baptism? Why baptism? Why didn't he... Why did he... Baptism in water, why, why didn't he make it something else? Well, you know, if, if someone asked me why baptism, I guess my, my response would probably be, why not? 
and what other acts could so fittingly represent the end of a life of sin and the beginning of a new life serving the Lord? Uh, if you, if you, uh, again, it wouldn't matter if you could, but I, I think it, probably you'd have to work a long, hard time to come up with anything even close that would be as appropriate uh, for the purposes that are described for baptism. You know, you talk about why baptism. Uh, you know, a lot of people have the wrong answer as to why baptism. You hear about people who say, well, you should be baptized to show other people that you're saved. Be bab- your, your baptism is a, is a display for other people to see. I don't read about that in the Scripture. Right. Baptism is a way for you to just demonstrate your commitment to God or for you to dedicate uh, maybe a, a child to God. And I think, or the Baptist position is, it's an outward sign of an inward grace. In other words, you're showing that you've been saved. Those concepts are not presented in the Bible. Right. Some say it's just how you join a denomination. You, if you want to be a part of this denomination, you're already saved, but you've got to be baptized in order to join our church. Yeah. The scriptures don't teach that. Exactly. So we've looked at what the scriptures tell us is the purpose of baptism, and it's in a stark contrast to what a lot of people in the religious world today are telling us the purpose of baptism. Exactly. All right. Daniel says, God has loved us more than anyone, and he has given us his son to save us and has invited us to his home. His command is to be baptized is most definitely well thought out. Thank you for that, Daniel. All right. We're going to get a break and get this week's bullet point when we get back. When we get back, let's talk about the mode of baptism. Some religious groups practice sprinkling. Some use pouring of water. Then there are folks like us who are adamant that the scriptures require an immersion in water, which is right. And you know, it's interesting. A lot of uh, the founders of various denominations uh, disagree with where their, the denominations that bear their name and follow them have gone. We'll look at what the, the scriptures teach, and we'll look at what some of these leaders say as well. What's the proper mode of baptism? Don't go anywhere. The virtual Bible study continues right after this. Don't go anywhere. You might miss something. The virtual Bible study continues right after this. This is Greg Gwynn with this week's bullet point. There's no debate. Everyone agrees. The evidence is abundantly clear. We are the richest people who have ever lived in the history of the world. We are more prosperous than any society that has ever existed, and we are more materially blessed than any other people living today. These indisputable facts should prompt several necessary responses from us. First, thanksgiving. We should never imagine that all of this abundance has resulted from our own initiative and effort. Instead, we must realize that our unique situation has resulted from many things done by others that have preceded us, and ultimately God deserves the credit for every good gift, James 1, verse 17. So be thankful. Second, benevolence. Quote, Whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up the bowels of compassion on him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? 1 John 3, verse 17. In our prosperity, let us not forget to look for opportunities to do good unto all men, Galatians 6, verse 10. Surely God will not hold us guiltless if we hoard our wealth and refuse to assist the legitimately needy. Third, liberality. In the episode of the widow's mites, Mark chapter 12, beginning verse 41, Jesus commended the widow for her sacrificial giving while noting that others had only given of their abundance. What about us? In regards to our giving to the Lord, are we sacrificial or do we only give what's left over after we have spent for everything else we want? And finally, caution. Jesus said, quote, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things that he possesseth. Luke 12, verse 15. If there ever was a people that need this warning, it's us. There's a great danger that we will begin to measure our life by money and things instead of recognizing the true value of our spiritual service to God. Be careful. Don't let prosperity cause you to set the wrong priorities in your life. God must be first, always. Our great prosperity poses tremendous challenges to us all. That's this week's bullet point. Think about it. Hey, Mommy. I'm too old. Um, this is the virtual Bible study. Now that you've had your break, it's back to the program. Hey, we're back on the program tonight. Reminding this program is brought to you by the College of Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. Find out more about us at our website, thevirtualbiblestudy.com. Check us out on Sundays and Wednesdays, uh, or maybe check us in the archives on our collegeview.com site, uh, where Kyle is uh, doing a great job. Uh, getting us up there on our services, getting the sermons uh, up there so you can not only listen to our sermon, you can watch it. Yeah, so it's yeah, every Sunday, of course, there's two. We have, yeah. there'll be three lessons every Sunday, and, of course, one on Wednesday night. So we have, there's a whole bevy of lessons every week. So, we're so and I, about four hours worth of content there every yeah. week. And I know some wise guys out there saying, well, I got the podcast. Why do I need the video? Well, 
because well, not only they get to see you. Oh, great! But you you've got charts up there to help us. Yeah, uh, follow yeah, along. you do get to see the charts so, if you watch it on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now it's hard to do that if you're exercising. Maybe you're out running. Maybe you can't watch you or driving. But if you can be stationary and watch, it might be of, of help to see yeah, those charts. Yeah. All right, we're talking about baptism tonight and making sense of it, comparing what the scriptures teach to what a lot of people say about it. Okay, so what about the mode of baptism? Now, when we say mode, what we mean is how you do it. What's, what's the physical act involved? Some groups practice sprinkling. Some use a little more water than that, and they pour a quantity of water over the candidate's head. We think the Bible teaches immersion. So how would we answer that question? Let's imagine that you never, ever, ever heard anything about baptism, uh, what it was, how it was done, but you just made up your mind. You're just going to go to the Bible. You're just going to read the Bible. You're going to understand the words that, th that are in the Bible, and you're going to just make your conclusion based upon what you read in the Bible. Okay. Okay. So what, would, what conclusion would you reach? Well, first of all, you would know that it was done in water uh, because in Acts chapter 8, Philip and the eunuch, verse 36, they went down into the water. Water was involved. So it involved water. You'd find out that it involves much water. Uh, in John chapter 3, verse 23, it says John, talking about John the Baptist, now, his baptism was not the baptism of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, but his baptism was of the same act. It's the same word. John was baptizing at Enon near to Salem because there was much water there. Right. So it, baptism involves water. It involves much water. Now, think about that. Just stop right there. If baptism was sprinkling, why did John have to have much water to do it? Yeah. In other words, if, if, if it was sprinkling, um, he was, he was, he'd gone to the Jordan River to a place on the Jordan River where there was a, obviously a deep pool of water. If it was just sprinkling, John could have been baptizing out of a mud puddle in Jerusalem for that Why matter. Why make people go to the river? Why yeah. not bring the water to them? Yeah. But he needed much water. Baptism, uh, again, just, I'm just, I don't even, I don't even know about baptism. I've never heard of baptism before. I'm just going to read my Bible and see what conclusion I would get. Well, I would know it involved water, much water. It would involve a going down into the water. In Acts chapter 8, verse 38, that's what Philip and the eunuch did. They both went down into the water, and he baptized him. I also remember. <laughs> and then the next verse, by the way, says they came up out of the water. I remember the, the situation there. They were on a trip. They were traveling. Uh, it was very inconvenient for them to all get wet, no doubt. But they went down into the river. There's something there, or there's some significance to that. Yeah, exactly right. Okay. Uh, Romans 6, verse 4, where we just read, said it, it's symbolic of a burial. When you bury someone, you don't just sprinkle dirt on them. You completely cover them up with dirt when you're burying them. A burial is a complete covering, not just a little bit of sprinkling. It, uh, Romans 6, verse 5 says it's like a planting. What do you do when you plant something? So you're planting seeds. You cover them clear up when you're planting. If you're planting a, a, a plant in the ground, you cover its roots up. But it, a planting is not, you don't just sprinkle some dirt on something to plant. Colossians 2.12 says it's, like a, it's the likeness of a resurrection when you come up out of the water. How, if, if it's sprinkling or pouring, how does the symbolic resurrection take place? I mean, if you're immersed, if you're completely covered in the water and you come forth, you can see that as the likeness of a resurrection. But it, how is it like a burial? And then how is it like a, a resurrection if it's just a sprinkling or a pouring? Good question. And then Romans 10, 12, 22 says it is uh, like the washing of the body. So... I never read about, I didn't, I, I didn't know a single thing about baptism, but I just went to the Bible and I read verses that talk about baptism. What conclusion would I reach just using the Bible as my guide? Well, I don't think you'd even consider sprinkling and pouring. After simple reading the verses, you'd say baptism is immersion. Baptism is immersion. And you know, that's actually what the word means. Yeah. Well, just real quickly, uh, we know that the word, our English word baptize or baptism is an anglicized word that was brought over from the Greek. They made, they made a new word. 
uh, they, if, if it had been translated, it would have definitely been translated as immersion or to dip or to plunge. Because that's what the Greek word baptizo means. It means to dip, to plunge, to submerge. There's not a Greek authority in the world who argues that. The word means to dip, plunge, or submerge. Baptizo. They just brought that word and made a new English word, baptize. Well, the new English word has to mean what the original word meant. And no Greek scholar anywhere would argue that baptism means anything other than a complete covering up, an immersion. Actually, if the if the the God had intended in the scriptures to authorize sprinkling. There's a word in Greek for sprinkling. Oh. It's rantizo. Rantizo is to <clears throat> sprinkle. If he had said sprinkle, uh, he that is sprinkled, he that believeth and is sprinkled shall be saved. There was, there's a word in Greek for that. That's not the word that was used. And also, by the way, there's a Greek word for poor. The, word, the Greek word cheo is the word for poor. Not in the, it's not, not in the used either. Okay. So the word, the word means, it very literally means to dip, to plunge, to submerge. It is an immersion. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mentioned before the break that a lot of uh, uh, founders of uh, denominational churches, they understood the, the scriptural teaching on this. Now, the denominations that follow them uh, today don't uh, still hold to these, but you can see that the, these, these individuals knew what the scriptures taught on it. For instance, John Wesley, who founded the Methodist Church said, I believe it is a duty to observe, so far as I can, to baptize by immersion. So the founder of the Methodist Church understood the scripture said, you need to be baptized by immersion. But Methodists don't typically do that. Okay. John Calvin said, the very word baptize, however, signifies to immerse, and it is certain that immersion was the practice of the ancient church. Again, John Calvin, whose followers do not always practice baptism by immersion. Many do, but not all. But the, uh, he had no doubt. And, and there is unanimous agreement among church historians that the early Christians definitely practiced immersion. Nobody argues otherwise. How about Martin Luther, uh, the Lutheran church that, that bears his name today? It says, the Greek baptizo means I immerse, and baptisma means immersion. For this reason, I would have the candidate for baptism totally immersed in water as the word baptisma signifies. Thus, it was also doubtless instituted by Christ. So Martin Luther says when Christ established baptism, he was immersing people, and that's the way that he said it should be done. Exactly right. Uh, yet there's a lot of confusion in the world today that say, people say, you know what, you can sprinkle, you can pour. Well, who gets to decide? Are you willing to say, well, you know, that's what they were doing in the New Testament? I think I don't think I need to do that. I don't, I don't need to get all wet. In other words, there's, there's complete agreement about the meaning of the word. There's a complete agreement from what the verses of the New Testament teach. And there's complete agreement even among church historians. Immersion, immersion, immersion. And so if I'm not going to practice that, I'm basically saying the, the evidence is there, but I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. Why wouldn't it matter? Why would, if the scriptures are so clear that it is immersion, why would you say, well, it doesn't matter. Just do it any way you want it. And you can call it baptism, although that's not what the word meant. You can call sprinkling, pouring. Maybe you get one of those mister bottles and you just sort of mist them with a little bit of water. We'll call that baptism. Do you, are you just making up the rules? I mean, the scriptures are very clear. There's no doubt. There's just right. no doubt about All that. Right. Our listeners, uh, Kent says, immersion in water is the only correct action of baptism. He references Romans 6, 3, and 4. That's, again, talking about baptism. Colossians 2, verse 12. Mohan said, immersion is the proper mode. Uh, we have Daniel, who says that uh, Acts 8, 38 and 39 uh, down in and back up out of the water, Romans 6, verse 4, buried through baptism into Jesus' death and raised to walk in newness of life. The words fit immersion. And then uh, Jared says, immersion, as can be seen in the case of the Ethiopian unit, Acts 8, 38, and 39. Also from the fact that it's referred to as a burial, Romans 6, verse 4, and Colossians 2, verse 12. Uh, in the chat room, uh, Dwight said the prime example in Acts with Philip and the eunuch is that they went down into the water. Baptism is a burial, nothing less, just as Jesus was buried in a tomb. Rick says 1 Peter 3.21 teaches that in baptism we are making an appeal to God for a clean conscience. Hebrews 9.13.14 teaches the blood of Christ purges or cleanses the conscience when, it is baptized, when one is baptized. It is when one is baptized that the blood of Christ cleanses from sin. And he says also in sprinkling and pouring the action is on the water. 
uh, that's the wrong object. The object of one being scripturally baptized is on the one being baptized. I never thought about it that way. Uh, so we're not taking an action on the water. We're taking an action on the candidate. Kind of, I never heard that argument maybe before. I have to think about that, Greg. Thanks. All right, let's get a break when we get back. Who should be baptized? Now that's good. Get down to the crux of the matter. Who should be baptized? If 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 baptism is important, then who needs to be baptized? We'll talk about. <coughs> excuse me. We'll talk about that and go to the top of the hour. The virtual Bible study rolls on right after this. Wow, it isn't so hard to understand the Bible after all. There's more exciting study and discussion coming after these messages. I'm Tom Goodall, a member of College View Church of Christ. Do you have a question about what has been said on the virtual Bible study tonight? Perhaps you disagree with something that was said, or would just like more information about what you've heard. If so, we'd love to hear from you. Please contact us with any questions or comments that you might have. Email us at questions at collegeview.com, and we can discuss any of your questions or comments with you privately or over email. Or if you would like to speak with someone in person, call us at 931 381 Four, five, six, seven. Our promise to you is that we'll do our very best to give you a Bible answer for anything that we do or teach, and that we'll do so in a loving manner. So if you have any questions or comments about our program tonight or any Bible subject, email us at questions at collegeview.com or call 931-381-4567. Thanks for listening to tonight's virtual Bible study, and we hope to hear from you soon. We're tracking the trends on the virtual Bible study. 53% of very happily married couples agree with the statement, quote, God is the center of our marriage, unquote. Compare that to only 7% of struggling couples who would say the same. That's from a book entitled The Surprising Secrets of Highly Happy Marriages. The Word of God says in Ephesians 5, verse 33, Let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. God's Word has the answers. Let's get back to studying it. The virtual Bible study rolls along. Now we're back on the program, going to the top of the hour. Now look at who should be baptized. This is where uh, we really need to pay attention because uh, the proper candidates for baptism, if we're one of them, we need, to, we need to know. All right, so again, who should be baptized? Well, let's just look to the Scriptures again and, and reach a conclusion. In Mark 16... Jesus said in verses 15 and 16, Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And so clearly there, the person to be baptized was first taught. So you go and preach the gospel, and he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Okay, that so comes after the preaching there. The, the preaching, uh, you teach, and then you baptize. Uh, that, that actually is Mark's account of the Great Commission, and Matthew's account is worded a little differently, but it says it's saying the same thing. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teaching them to deserve all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you all the way even to the end of the world. So teaching is a requirement of being bapt uh, a prerequisite, I guess is what we want to say. And other, ba other versions may say instead of teach, make disciples. But in inherent in that idea of making disciples is the idea of teaching. You can't make disciples unless you teach. A, a disciple is a learner yeah. and follower. Yeah, so other translations may not have go and teach, but they have go and make disciples. So if you're, gonna, if you're, if, if you're making a disciple, you have to teach them to make them a disciple, That's right? That's inherent in the term, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you've got to first be taught. You have to believe what you have heard. Plenty of places we could go to, but here's a, a, a one we don't use very often in Acts 18, verse 8. Acts 18, verse 8, Paul's in the city of Corinth, and it says, Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. So they were taught, they believed, and they were baptized. Now, it's interesting that the book of Acts contains the conversions of literally thousands of people in the first century. And in every single case, the people who were baptized were first taught. There was, there's never an example of someone who was baptized without first being instructed. Because as Paul said in Romans chapter 6, we've referenced Romans chapter 6 several times, but verse 17 says... God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. So in the very context of describing baptism in the early verses of the chapter, he, he's thankful that the Romans had obeyed from the heart what had been delivered to them. 
their, their baptism was obedience. It came from the heart. You can't obey from the heart what you don't know in your heart, what you haven't been taught. That reminds me of Romans, or 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21 that we mentioned earlier. It's the answer of a good conscience. Baptism saves us. It's not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience. So How would I know? To, how would my how conscience would I be moved? Unless yeah. I had been taught first. Exactly, exactly okay. right. So teaching is a prerequisite. Believing is a prerequisite. Repentance is a prerequisite. And... Acts chapter 2, verse 38, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter had been preaching to the very people who were responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus, it says in verse 37, they were, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for or unto the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So they had to repent and be baptized for or in order to obtain the remission of sins. Repentance, a change of heart leading to a change of action, is necessary prerequisite to scriptural baptism. And then the confession of the confession of one's faith in Jesus. We, we've referenced several times in Acts chapter eight the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, and and I understand that there's some, some people have some question as to the, whether or not. The, all of this text was included in the original. Uh, some say there's some spurious addition here, but we're, we're going to take it as it's stated that uh, the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou believest with all in thy heart, thou mayest. He answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then he baptized him, showing confession prerequisite to baptism. So, who should be baptized? People who've been taught, who believe who are willing to repent of their sins and confess their faith in Jesus, should be baptized for the remission of sins. Again, if I, had never, if I never knew anything at all about baptism and I wanted to know something about it and I read the scriptures, I would conclude that those were the things that preceded baptism. All right. Okay. Now, that gets us to another point and uh, one that's important for us to talk about, and that's about infant baptism. That's a common practice in the world today. Uh, it was uh, perhaps initiated by the Catholic Church. Um, <clears throat> what about infant baptism? Well, first of all, I just want to reiterate what we just said. In all the thousands of conversions, in all the cases in the book of Acts where people were baptized, there's not a confirmable case of infant baptism among any of those. Right. Uh, and, and so... Why, why do we not read in our New Testament about them baptizing babies? If that, was, if that was standard practice, and if it's something we should be doing, why wouldn't we, first, uh, just a question, why wouldn't we have an example of it? Secondly, we just enumerated the prerequisites of being baptized. You have, to, you have to be taught, you have to believe, you have to repent, and you have to confess. Babies can't be taught. Uh, they can't. They can't believe. They're not capable of the thought process that would lead them to faith. They don't need to repent because passages like Ezekiel 8, verses 4 and 20, Matthew 18, verse 3, Matthew 19, verse 14, says that children are innocent, born innocent. We do not believe that, that, that there is inherited sin. And so they don't even need to repent. But could, wouldn't be, they, even if they had sin, they, they wouldn't be capable of repentance. They can't speak yet. They couldn't verbally confess their faith in Jesus. So we have no example of infant baptism. We have no command of bab infant baptism. And even if babies needed salvation, which they don't, they wouldn't be capable of doing the things that are prerequisite of scriptural baptism. You know, you referenced uh, Acts 8, verse, uh, we're talking about the eunuch, when he wanted to be baptized, in verse 36, they came, went on the way, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And notice what condition Peter put on it. He didn't say, well, sure, we can baptize you, just, let's just go take care of this now. He says, if you believe, you may. Peter said, you've got to believe, or it won't, it's not going to be effective. He, he didn't say, you know, uh, eunuch, what we'll do is we'll go down here and we'll baptize you now, and then as you study along and you begin to believe in Christ, then you'll be covered. You'll be okay. No, he said, if you believe, you'll then we can. And then also, look at Acts chapter 19. Paul comes to Corinth. You remember, there were some folks there who were disciples. There were folks trying to live for Christ. 
And he asked them in verse 2 of Acts 19, uh, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto them, What were you baptized? They said, Unto John's baptism. When he found out about that, he baptized them again. So they didn't understand. They didn't have right knowledge. They didn't have the right knowledge. They had been baptized, but that wasn't effectual. And they'd even be baptized in the right manner or mode. Immersion by John. But not with the right understanding of heart. And so can an infant have the right understanding of heart? If you ask an infant, unto what were you baptized? He'd say, well, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 didn't, I wasn't aware of what was going on. I, I, I don't remember a thing about it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so right. they would need to be baptized again, per yeah. the pattern in Acts 19. Exactly right. Okay. Um, so let's let's read real quickly. We're almost out of time. Let's read real quickly uh, uh, from our listeners. Kent says, "Only those who have believed the gospel, repented of sin, have confessed faith in Christ." Mark sixteen sixteen, Acts two thirty eight, Acts eight thirty seven. Infants cannot meet those stated conditions, therefore cannot be scripturally baptized. Exactly right. Mohan says baptism is an adult decision for one who, who has truly believed in Christ and has repented by making a decision to be a true disciple follower of Jesus. They must be old enough to count the cost of being a true disciple of Jesus and what being a disciple truly entails. Thank you, Mohan. Daniel says those who are cut to the heart by the word and believe and are willing to repent, Acts 2, 37 through 38, the command is to be taught and understood and believed. Infants are not able to do this. Okay. And Jared says, those who believe and confess our Lord Jesus Christ, Acts 8.37, and repent of their sins, Acts 2.38, infants can't do these things and they have no sins to wash away, so baptism isn't for babies. All right. I think those are good points. In the chat room tonight, uh, 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 Rick says, to come to believe in anything demands the ability to sift and weigh the evidence regarding what we may be trying to believe. The infant cannot do this, thus cannot be scripturally baptized. And then Lou in Minnesota says, depends on which version you read of on the Great Commission. The New American Standard version uh, of the the word for uh, the word for word translation says, "Baptize first. Uh, it does well. It well, does. Let me read uh, uh, so, some of the newer versions. Read this way. Here's the English Standard version. It says. Um, Matthew 28, 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and I behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So, how do you make disciples? You, you make disciples by teaching them. A disciple is a learner and follower. So you make disciples. You teach them. They commit to follow Jesus. You baptize them. And then you teach them more. So actually, in, in, in that sequence, there are two teachings that take place. There's initial teaching that leads them to the decision to be baptized. There's subsequent teaching to, that, concerning all things that Jesus commands his disciples to do. So there's initial teaching that would lead one to be baptized. They are baptized, and there's subsequent teaching that takes place concerning all things that Jesus said to do. Okay. Um, Lou says, goes on, in the Old Testament, Jews had circumcision at eight days old. In Colossians 2, verses 11 to 12, it talks about circumcision through Christ in baptism. Baptism is washing away sin and allowing the Holy Spirit to come into you. I would prefer to have my children have the power and influence of the Holy Spirit working in them to help them with their faith. Okay, uh, Colossians 2, verse 11, in whom, we, uh, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of sins uh, of the flesh of the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein ye are risen with him through the faith in the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. So, uh, I think Lou is right that there's, there's, in other words, there was a literal circumcision uh, of the Israelite children. They actually cut off a part of the flesh. We cut off the sins of our lives when we, when we commit to, to obedience to Christ. I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I think there's a, a symbolism there, but to say that that therefore would authorize baptizing babies is, is, it, that, that's, that's making more of the symbol than the symbol intends to be used for. If, 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 uh, if I make myself clear, you know, sometimes even when Jesus taught parables, if you try to make a point out of everything in the parable, you, you, you're, you're stretching it too far. 
And I think to say that the age of circumcision is therefore the equivalent age of baptism is not borne out in that text and would be a contradiction with the arguments we were just making about necessary prerequisites for scriptural baptism. One of those being in verse 12 of Colossians 2, uh, you're risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. And so I've got to have, I've got to have an understanding of what I'm doing so I can be risen with in understanding yeah. the operation of God, what's happening as a result of this. Okay, I, I, yeah, I think you're exactly right. And and one other thing here, and I think this is a good question. Uh, baptism is washing away sin, allowing the Holy Spirit to come into you. Well, again, babies don't have sin. So if you baptize a baby, it wouldn't be to wash away sin and allow the Holy Spirit to come in. I would prefer to have my children have the power and influence of the Holy Spirit working in them to help them with their faith. So if I baptize someone who hasn't even been taught and they receive the Holy Spirit because they've been baptized, and then that makes them maybe more receptive or, or empowers them. In a, why don't we just go out and forcibly baptize people on the street? You're saying adults who don't believe? Yeah. So, you know, I've used this illustration before. Why don't we get a truck with a big tank of water on the back? And we'll get, you know, several strong armed men, and we'll just drive up and down the streets of our town. And everybody we catch out on the sidewalk, we'll just snatch them and dunk them in the water. And then they'll have the Holy Spirit because they've been baptized. They didn't know anything. They weren't taught. They weren't instructed. But they got the Holy Spirit because they were dunked in the water. And and that'll help them. They'll be easier to teach subsequent to that. Why wouldn't we do that? Well, nobody would argue for that. I'm not. But I'm just saying consistency would say if I'm baptizing an infant child because when they're baptized, they receive the Holy Spirit and that will help them. As they, as they grow and learn, why wouldn't I do the same thing for an adult? Who's maybe struggling with... Who hasn't been taught. He hasn't been taught, but I'm going to... Because when I baptize him, even though he hasn't been taught, when I baptize him, if it, if, it, if it does that for an infant, why wouldn't it do it for an adult too? You see what I'm saying? Right. right. If we don't do that, then nobody would argue for that. But consistency would say if it works for the infant, it would work for an adult to be baptized before they were taught. Okay. All right. Um, we are out of time. We're over time. Uh, but a good discussion and uh, a discussion that we can continue. Uh, if you've got questions or, uh, <coughs> excuse me, maybe we can't continue it. I can't talk about it. you got uh, the cough if, going. If you've got, you got questions or, uh, or, or disagree with us, we'd like to hear talk more. Uh, about that, uh, we w uh, we welcome you to contact us at any time. Kyle, you've been listening tonight, and I haven't looked in your direction much, but any comments from you? No, it's a good study. It's a very important study. I think people need to have an understanding of what baptism is and the importance of it. So it's, it's a good study. All right. Dad, uh, any comments from you? I think it's an important, a really important subject. We've talked about it so many times in the first Bible study, but it's, it's always worthy of additional study. All right. And, and what really matters is what do the Scriptures teach? Exactly. I mean, uh, and so we've taken and expressed our understanding of the scriptures. But what matters is what the scriptures teach, and if you disagree with us, we'd love... Uh, or, or we always hold out an invitation. Ask your preacher. We'd be glad to invite him to come with us on the virtual Bible study, and we'll just talk about these matters one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Not mean, not disagreeable. Just We'll just talk about them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, if you want to, or if your preacher wants to, we'd be glad to engage. All right. Uh, we appreciate you being a part of the program tonight, and we hope you benefited from our study and discussion of God's Word. We hope to make plans to be back this time next week for another edition of the Virtual Bible Study. In the meantime, we encourage you to put God first in your life, study His inspired Word of the Bible, and live by it every day. You'll never regret it. Thanks for listening to the Virtual Bible Study, brought to you by the College View Church of Christ. The College View Church of Christ meets at 1618 Hampshire Pike in Columbia, Tennessee. If you are in the Columbia, Tennessee area, we encourage you to worship with the College View Church of Christ on Sunday mornings at 930 and on Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock. The College View Church of Christ also welcomes you to attend their Wednesday night Bible studies at 7 o'clock. If you have any questions about something that was said on tonight's broadcast or would like more information about the College View Church of Christ, please call 931-381-4567. That number again, 931-381-4567. Or for more information on the internet, visit collegeview.com. Be sure to tune into the virtual Bible study this time next Thursday for another informative study of God's Word.